today. And I thank y'all for being here. Jeremiah 14 is on our, our Bible pages today. And that's what we're going to be uh, walking through together here. Jeremiah 14. Um, as I was reading this, I don't know if you felt this way, but as I was reading this, I was thinking, my goodness, is that not so similar to where we are right now in our nation? And maybe you feel like Jeremiah sometimes, like um, you're the only one, or maybe there's very few that seem to have any kind of heart for the Lord and desire for the things of the Lord. And I want you to know that God is not ignorant of what's going on. He wasn't ignorant in Jeremiah's day, what was going on in Judah. In fact, he was very intentional to reach out to Judah. And that's the very reason he, he called Jeremiah. There's a phone right there. Proclaim the message that he did. And so um, today we're going to be looking at Jeremiah 14 and, and walking through. It's not a long chapter. We'll walk through this chapter um, together. Just a reminder from last week, though, to get us to where we are. Last week, we uh, we talked about dirty laundry. You remember that? that um, Judah had <laughs> yeah. a defiled <laughs> undergarment to God because of their wickedness. And then we also talked about filled wine jars, remember? And and mm -hmm. Judah thought the wine jars are going to be filled with the blessing and the abundance of God. And God was saying, no, they're going to be filled with my wrath. That my judgment is going to overflow those jars because of your wickedness and disobedience. And then we finally ended up talking about, about change, that we, we can't change ourselves. We may some change some behaviors on the outside, but we can't change the nature of who we are. Only the power of God can do that. God's the only one that can transform us from the inside out. And um, just as Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, um, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. Well, it's that born again that brings that brings about the in, internal change. It's not an external change. So here we are in, in Jeremiah 14. And Jeremiah 14 is the beginning of, uh, it's really the next four chapters are a series of messages, uh, which are kind of interspersed with his own prayers. It's almost like Jeremiah's writing and preaching and yet he pauses for a minute and talks about a personal prayer that he, or he, you know, he has a personal conversation with God and he goes back to preaching again. And so these next four chapters are going to be um, a, a compilation of messages and um, prayers and um, even the way that God answers those prayers, which is kind of neat to see um, in those. Sometimes if we were going to write our prayer concerns, if we take this one list and write our prayer concerns down, which these are, they're printed down and it may be God answers this one in a way that we see him answering. And we say, well, here's how God answered this. We may do that today. But this one right here, it may take months. But God is at work. It's not, it doesn't mean God's slack. He's at work in all of that. Um, sometimes it means he's at work in us until, he's, until he answers um, that prayer um, with a yes or a no or, or a wait, which is where the way God tends to answer those prayers. And so we, we see this in Jeremiah the next four chapters. We'll see some personal prayers of Jeremiah, and then also some responses um, to God. When we read these chapters here, we'll also hear words of pain. Um, we know that Jeremiah is a weeping prophet, and man, he is so descriptive in these, and you can, you can feel the burden um, when you put yourself in his shoes that he has, and where is Jeremiah's pain coming from? Does anyone know? Where is Jeremiah? Why is he so burdened? Why do you think Jeremiah is so burdened and hurting? Because of what was going on or is going on in the nation. That's a big, that's a big part. Yes, he was because of what the people, how the people were responding, what was mm -hmm. going on and mm -hmm. the devastation they were seeing around them right. because of their own wickedness. That's another one. Was there any, what else was another reason Jeremiah was hurting? What do you he think? He loved them. He loved them. He did. He loved the people. I mean, these are God's people and these are his people and he loved them. And when you love someone and you see them hurting, you hurt with them. So that's a part of his burden as well. Is there anything else? He was bound to be frustrated for <laughs> that he keeps telling them and they, and they aren't listening. <laughs> and that's something. Yeah. You it's know, like, God a calls you to, right. <laughs> If God calls you to do something, you kind of think, well, this is going to be successful in the way that I would describe success. Well, yeah. Jeremiah's success wasn't successful in the way that man would say was successful, That's but he was successful in being obedient to the Lord in that. And so there was mm -hmm. a frustration because as much as he proclaimed God's message with clarity 
and with with integrity. Um, they just weren't listening. No. They wouldn't listen, and that's got to be frustrating, mm -hmm. terribly frustrating. So all of these are reasons why Jeremiah, yeah, was, was hurting and in pain. And um, I, I, I want to share this one quote with you. It's from Warren Wearsby, a Bible commentator. He said, if ever an Old Testament servant had to take up his cross in order to follow the Lord, it was Jeremiah. And, you know, over the last months that we've been walking through the book of Jeremiah, that's, um, that, that's, that's born itself out. He is a burdened prophet um, and, and a hurting prophet. Um, just to give you context, remember, um, they were, Judah was sinning. And so right now what we're going to look at in, in context for Jeremiah 14 is that the, the rebellion and the wickedness of Judah has, has brought them to a place they're beginning to experience um, things that God is allowing as, as judgment, um, as the beginning of judgment. And part of this is with droughts, a series of droughts. The whole land began to suffer. And we're going to see that uh, very clearly here in Jeremiah 14. So let's start with this vivid description of a drought beginning in the verse, uh, first six verses, this physical drought upon the kingdom of Jeremiah, I mean, kingdom of Judah, um, which Jeremiah dwelt in. And so verse, four, uh, verse one of chapter 14, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Judah mourns and her gates languish. Her people lament on the ground and the cry of Jerusalem goes up her nobles send their servants for water and they come to the cisterns which were these big pits in the ground they come to the cisterns and they find no water and they return with their vessels empty they are ashamed and confounded and they cover their heads you'll see that phrase cover their heads repeated in this it's, a, it's an act of of um grief because of the ground that is dismayed, since there is no rain in the land, the farmers are ashamed. They cover their heads. Even the doe, the animals, even the doe in the field forsakes her newborn fawn because there is no grass. The wild donkeys stand on the very heights. They pant for air like jackals. Their eyes fail because there's no vegetation. Those first six verses, I mean, it, God's word is, is utilizing all the senses, all, you know, almost all, the, all five senses that we, we um, see the world with or we experience the world with. And they are, um, and also the emotion that's there because they are in a drought or one of the series of droughts that they experience because of their, their own wickedness. He uses the word lament there um, in verse two. You know, like people or people lament on the ground. What comes to mind when you hear the word lament? What is what is that? Morning. Yeah, morning with you, M O U R N I N G, right? Mm hmm. Um, the, the people are mourning. Now, we can have different reasons that we mourn. Regret. Regret is a reason that we can mm -hmm. mourn. That's mm -hmm. right. I regret what I've done, I regret my own actions or my own mm -hmm. attitude. We can also mourn because of circumstances. I can, I can mourn circumstances without regret, even if I cause them. <laughs> Think about that. I can do something that I should not have done, and it leads me to a bad circumstance, and I can think, oh, my goodness, these bad circumstances, but still be um, unwilling to consider or ignorant or unwilling to consider my actions cause these circumstances. Mm -hmm. I can suffer loss because of my own actions and mourn mm -hmm. over the loss, but not mm -hmm. the cause of the loss. Mm -hmm. That's where that's where Judah was. They had no water. God allowed them to go for a long season without water. And they are lamenting on the ground. They're expressing grief. When you read Jeremiah 14, you'll see some seems to be some words of action that are, are words that represent they are repentant. They, they're wanting to repent. But we come to find out God knows the heart. And, and so God, God just doesn't see the outward action. He knows the heart. That's where, that's really what matters. My outward actions don't necessarily reflect the attitude of my heart um, when it comes to repentance. Um, so they are, they are lamenting. And, and just by the way, there is a lament. I, I don't want to 
um, skip this moment just for a second to say lamenting is actually a part of um, knowing and growing in Christ. It's a part of spiritual development because God grieves. God grieves. Did you know that? God <laughs> grieves. What does God grieve? What causes God to grieve? What causes the Holy Spirit? Due to I'm sorry? Due yeah. to disobedience of the people? It does. Yeah, when we're disobedient, mm -hmm. God's word says our sin, the, the Holy Spirit grieves over the sin in our lives. And the more I go, I grow in the Lord, the more I need to, actually God, God leads me and brings me to a place where I grieve over what God grieves over. That I grieve over the sin in my life. And I grieve over the, the results of sin in the world, the brokenness in the world. Um, it's not okay to be okay with brokenness. It's not okay to be okay with brokenness. It doesn't mean I can fix it, but what causes God to grieve, I pray that the Lord helps me to grow in that. And, you know, when someone, some, when, even when there's a loss, um, I know many of you have lost someone close to you. And, you know, that. and that's, that, I'm not saying grief is bad. Grief can be good because it means there was something of value or someone of value that, that is no longer in your presence anymore, right? And so that shows value. A lot of times we, we want to end somebody's grief quickly, right? Oh, I hope, I hope you don't grieve very long. Well, if my grief is bringing me into the presence of the Lord and I'm finding my strength and my peace and my comfort from God himself, that grief, that lamenting has, has brought me to a place of worship of God. And so I'm thankful for the, the opportunity to lament in that sense. I mean, Jeremiah here, he, he is struggling um, internally, and there's a lament even in his own expressions um, throughout the whole book of Jeremiah. And then the book of Lamentations, which is Lamentations, um, that's, that's also written by Jeremiah. And you can see in there how Jeremiah's grief continually brings him to the Lord. Um, and, and unfortunately, for the, the people of I'm hearing a really loud noise. Oh, speaker, putting it on speaker. I'm unfortunately when um when Ju Judah is lamenting, it's not a lament on their own soul. It's a lament because of their circumstances, and they want the they they be content with fixing everything. And, um, I don't have to see him. You can do it, hold him, or whatever. All right, we're going to continue. I can. We can hear some of y'all talking. I believe it might be the Margie and Marshall. Just to let you know. Yeah, yeah, we we we've got it on the on the tablet a little bit. Keep okay. going. <laughs> Just didn't want to talk about the conversations you think were secret and they're not, because <laughs> we can hear. You. Every few seconds, we have a telephone come on. The green telephone. That's right. Yeah. All right. Can y'all hear me? Okay? Yeah. Everybody hear me? Let's, um, let's go back here. They are suffering a huge drought because of their own obedience. And over the years, by the way, this was not their first drought. But over the years, they had experienced multiple droughts. And we've even seen this in, in Jeremiah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us a quick walk down memory lane, okay? I'm going to point back to a couple of places in Jeremiah where Jeremiah was speaking or preaching. In Jeremiah 3.3, 3, he, he says, you have polluted the land. God's speaking here. He says, you have polluted the land with your vile whoredom. Remember, that is a strong terminolo terminology. And you're going to remember some of this if you've been in our study. But verse 3, says, therefore, the showers have been withheld and the spring rain has not come cause of their evil back in chapter three um it, there was a drought there was a drought in north carolina a few years ago does anybody remember that mm -hmm. yeah it was rough wasn't it yeah you couldn't if you if you were into landscaping at your house i'm so sorry because suddenly <laughs> you didn't really have much grass and it, it began to be um very concerning because while the area lake levels were going lower and lower um, and so there was, you know, we weren't quite at the point, we weren't quite at the point 
and water in homes that I remember other than you couldn't water your lawns, you couldn't wash your cars and um, those kinds of things. It was, it was this situation that Judah is in is much more serious and the Lord withheld the reins. Then in Jeremiah 5, verse 24 says, they do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God who gives the rain in its season the autumn rain and the spring rain and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. And so they were experiencing drought then. It was because the people of Judah didn't fear the Lord. And so the rains were withheld. And then again in Jeremiah 12, not that long ago, um, how long will the land mourn and the grass and air of every field wither? For the evil of those who dwell in it, the beasts and the birds are swept away because they said, he will not see our latter end. And so there, there was rain that was being withheld and the the visual here is the land is mourning because of that. And so droughts, um, droughts were widespread. And this was a serious drought, very serious drought that they were in. Droughts affect everybody. It affects the rich. It affects the poor. It affects those that are urban, like in Jerusalem. It affects those that are rural, out, out, outskirts, Anathoth and Bethlehem are very, very rural. Um, and everybody was affected, even the animals. The description of a doe here leaving her fawn or a donkey out here panting and not even moving just with wide eyes, just panting, doesn't know what to do, just needing water so badly. The whole world seemed to be um, in pain because of the rebellion of God's people. That's a physical drought. <clears throat> when I was, you know, there's, there's a part of this is very picturesque for a spiritual drought as well, because a spiritual drought can also have impact in our lives and the lives of those around us. And the spiritual drought is being parched from the lack of presence and the power of God. And so uh, your question on the guide said this, you know, what are the effects of a spiritual drought in God's people? What, how would you describe a spiritual drought? What is that like in, in God's people today? What's the impact of, of someone that's not um, living in, in the presence and the power of, of Christ? It can be a cause or effect. What do you think about that? What what talk to me about spiritual drought? What's what causes that or what what impact does that have? Like of love one for another. Say that again. Like like L A C K of love one for another. Mm, goodness. True. Lack of love for one another. That could be a cause and an, <laughs> an and effect. effect. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, of a drought, spiritual drought. That's true. What else? Obedience. Yeah, or lack of obedience. <laughs> what cause of that? Um, and no relationship with God means um, people are trying to accomplish everything on their own, trying to be their own boss. True. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have one throne in our lives, and we like to sit on it, don't we? And it's not, and, mm -hmm. and it's a place where God belongs, not yeah. us. Yeah. I want to be in control. That's right. Uh -huh. And all these things uh, tend to bring us inward. And when we seek, when we live a life that's inward, a life of self, what we're doing is we're pushing um, our attention, our heart's affections away from the Lord. And we will be in a spiritual drought. We will uh, be spiritually dry. Thankfully, the Lord's word tells us about how not to be in a spiritual drought. It doesn't mean that we're going to have easy times. Even in hard times, even, even in a physical drought <laughs> or even in a figurative drought of circumstances in our lives, we can still know the refreshing presence of, of Christ, the refreshing presence of his word. One, one um, way is in delighting in his word. And I'm, I'm going to read to you a passage. I bet some of you know where this passage comes from. I'm not even going to say where it comes from. See if you re recognize this. You can tell me in a minute if you know where it comes from. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a, listen to this, he is like a tree planted by streams of waters that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. That's what the spiritual refreshing is. And when we delight in the Lord, it's like a tree. And, or like a tree planted by a stream of water. Does anybody know where that passage comes from? Psalm 1. 
That's Psalm 1. Oh, it is. And it's a very precious passage. No, is it Psalms 91? It's one. Psalm 1. 1. Psalm 1. I love that passage. And then John 4, Jesus has an encounter with a Samaritan woman at the well. Do you remember what he told her about water? He had a conversation <laughs> about water. Mm -hmm. He talked about living water. He talked about the water that if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. Remember that conversation in John 4? Everyone who drinks of this water, the well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will turn into a, um, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So if we want to know how to avoid spiritual drought, well, we need to go see the source, <laughs> the living water, and that's Christ himself. And we need to delight in his word. And delight doesn't just mean, oh, that sounds great. Delight means I wrap myself up. I surrender my life to your word. And I long for your word. Speak to me, Lord. Make it like honey to my lips. And um, when, we, when we live in that kind of love with the Lord and love for his word, then we can we can rest assured in knowing that spiritual drought um, is not something that God would walk us through. Physical drought, yes, but we will, we will know the presence of the Lord. And that doesn't mean I'm always going to be able, anytime I open my Bible, it's going to be like the Garden of Eden opens up in my soul. There's times all of us go through when we can say, I read my Bible, I'm just not sure what I'm getting out of that. When those, those instances, just, just trust that the Lord is speaking to your heart and seek to be obedient to what you're reading. Feelings may or may not come later, but let your heart and your soul delight in his word, um, even if, it's, if it seems dry when you're reading. And there's, there's a lot of passages that can be easier to um, find or, or more difficult to find refreshing in just from the reading, especially in some of the Leviticus, the laws and stuff. But understand when you look at the whole narrative of God that he has in his word, the meta narrative, and even in the law, it points us to the fact that we need a savior that none of us are going to be obedient to the law. We can't. We need a Savior. Then, um, then it's the Spirit that brings that, that fulfillment in our soul as we read His Word, knowing that God is speaking to our hearts. Um, every, time we, every time we open His Word, none of that is wasted. His Word will not return void, is what He said, tells us. Um, we, you know, when, when they're in this drought and they're calling out, oh, we, it's so bad here, they're mourning. Um, they had chosen to rebel against God and God's allowing them to be judged. What if they had repented? That's, that's, that's interesting to consider for a moment. What if they had repented? What would that look like? Well, actually the next section kind of tells us um, what it would look like. Look what he says in Jeremiah 14. We're going to go through seven through, through nine. He says, though our iniquities testify against us, Act, O Lord, for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many, and we have sinned against you. Those are words that are, are pointing to a repentance. Um, repentance would have been to respond to the testimony of their own iniquities. It says our iniquities testify against us. Well, repentance means respond to that and respond by saying, Lord, I'm changing a direction here. I'm, I'm going, doing a 180. Um, I'm changing my mind about this, and I'm, I'm going to allow my feet to follow my mind. I'm allowing my heart to follow my mind in this and turn from my sin. But they didn't. And so Jeremiah's praying for them. He says, at, in, in verse 7 there, he says, Act, O Lord, for your name's sake. And he continues. He's saying, Lord, be, here's the reason. They're not going to turn. This is what it would look like, but they're not going to do it. But act for your name's sake. Bring rain, Lord, for your name's sake. Um, and he says, Oh, you hope... You, hope of Israel, its savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? It's talking about God. Why would you be a tourist in your own land? In verse 9, he says, why should you be like a man confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot save? You, yet you, O oh Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. You can see Jeremiah here as he's praying. He's imagining what uh, repentance would be like. It's either he's imagining it or the people are actually calling out to the Lord in this way. But as you read further, as we read further in Jer um, Jeremiah 14, we see that God knows even though they call out what seems right, 
that they are that it's not by their hearts. Their hearts are not willing to turn and repent. It's kind of like um, a few chapters are, are in Second Kings, actually, when Josiah found the law and they made reforms there in the temple and the people were all cheering that on. And yet it was not, it did not last at all. There was not a, a, a long lasting reformation. Um, there was a brief moment of hope there, there was going to be reformation. But God says, you, you know, you speak in this with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And that's what Jeremiah in this passage, he's, he's either imagining it or it's empty repentance by spoken by the mouths of the people with their lips, but not with their, their hearts. So Jeremiah, he's pleading for God's inter intervention. He's pleading God, even, even for your name's sake. Questioning your guys said to what does Jeremiah feel on behalf of God's people? What, what is he appealing to? He's appealing to the namesake of God, Lord, this, is, is for your glory, for your namesake. And um, basically what he's saying is, Lord, what are people going to think? <laughs> they know we're, we, we claim to be your people. And if we suffer judgment, if we suffer judgment, how does that look on, on you? you they're going to say you are like a stranger in your own land, like a traveler in the like land. Tra you have no care for the land. You're just kind of come and serve and leave. Kind of like when you and I, are, if, we, if we visit somewhere as tourists, we go and we see the sights, but we don't go to we don't go and and try to make any kind of lasting change, or we don't go and try to improve what's there, um, thinking that well my week here is going to transform this this place. No, we go and observe, and there's and, and Jeremiah saying this is this is what people are going to say. You're like, and it says you're like a confused man. You know they're going to think you're like a weak warrior who can't do anything. Why do you think Jeremiah is so intent? on pleading for the people who are rejecting God. That's actually kind of a question that was, was answered a little bit earlier because he, he had a love for these people and he had a hope that they would return to God, didn't he? He wanted, uh, if there's one thing that Jeremiah wanted, he wanted and longed for Judah to return to God, to repent and return. And he poured everything into proclaiming that message of God. He's so intent, even appealing to God's nature, God's, God's glory, God's name, and not just the, the, the repentance of the people because it was, it was not there. So let me ask you this question. Does God show mercy? Yes, he does, doesn't he? Of course God shows mercy. Mm -hmm. Does, does God show justice? Yes. Yeah, he absolutely shows justice. He is a just God. Does, does God show judgment? Mm -hmm. He yeah. has to. Of course he does. Because he's holy. And we can see a place in scripture where his love, his mercy, his justice, his judgment all come together. And that's on the cross. The cross, we, we know that God loves us. We say that God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. That's John 3, 16, right? He sent Christ to die on the cross for us. Uh, that if we believe in him, we should be married. It's because of his love for us. Not separate from his love is his holiness. Not separate from his love is his justice and his mercy too and his grace. All of these are who God is. And so every bit of this comes together at the cross. So the, God, the, the cross is just as much a demonstration of God's justice and his judgment as it is his love and his mercy and his grace. It's just as much. It reflects to us who God is. And so when God acts with judgment, it's not because he's minimizing his love. He's, he's not minimizing who he is. But it's because of his love and his holiness that he must judge our sin. And, and, and if he didn't, if he could just set aside his judgment and just love us apart from his judgment, well, then we wouldn't have even had a cross. He wouldn't have sent his son. But he can't deny who he is. And he is a holy God. And that's why he must judge and my, he must punish sin. And so here, um, when Jeremiah is appealing, God, okay, they're not going to repent. But could you bring rain because 
of just because he's the sake of your name. And, and it's his heart for his people that he's pleading this to God. Well, how does God respond to Jeremiah's pleading here? Look in verse 10. Thus says the Lord concerning his people. They have loved to wander thus. They have not restrained their feet. <laughs> they, um, therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and will punish their sins. When it says he will remember their iniquity, it's not like I forgot about this and not later. Oh, yeah, I remember that. You know, like, uh, like we can do where, with car keys or something. It's not like I had them. I remember having them. Where did I put those? It means he, is, he will hold this against them. He will He's not forgotten this, that now he will act upon their sin. Verse 11, he says, the Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. We've seen this before. God is telling Jeremiah, do not pray. Though they fast, I will not hear their cry. And though they offer burnt and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will, con I will consume them by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. God didn't respond by sending rain because he knew their hearts. He knew their acts of repentance were just on the surface and did not it was not because of a heart that turned back to god in verse 10 what is it that the people of judah have loved in verse 10 what do you see there what did they love my version has a word that they love to wander thus is that what your version says yeah they love to wander what does that mean do whatever they want <laughs> Go wherever they want. Yeah, they were completely directionless. There's one direction they did not want to go. Yeah. But everywhere else, they would just wander and go everywhere. That's why they would they would mm -hmm. give lip service to God in the temple. But then they go out and then they worship false gods outside mm -hmm. the temple. Mm -hmm. Even some with involving child sacrifice. I mean, it was terrible. And they would they would continue to, to do that. They would not restrain their feet. They would, it was like they were, um, they had no boundaries. <laughs> they had no boundaries. Well, except for one. I'm not going to get really serious about my relationship with God here, following him. The rest there is why. It reminds me of a hymn, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. When I read this, I, read I prone to wandering. There's a, there's a particular verse in, in that hymn. Um, listen to this. I'm not going to sing, so. <laughs> <laughs> Big sigh of relief. Go ahead and breathe that. Vince, I know you want to say something. <laughs> Some of y'all could sing this, but listen to, the, to the, the lyrics of this song. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering, there's a word, from the face of God. He to save my soul from danger, interposed his precious blood. Now here's the verse two. Listen to this. This is where the, the, the part that comes from. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. What, what is a fetter? I had to Google it to make sure. What's a fetter? Is it a restriction or a binding or something? It is, yeah. It's a binding. It's it's a chain or a, a strap. Mm -hmm. And it's for feet, actually. It's a binding of the mm -hmm. feet. So that the mm -hmm. feet would wander. <laughs> Probably the kind of things you won't put on your kids when they were little. You have to take them to the store. Here, let me bind your feet up a little bit so you, you're not doing this. Where's my kids? Well, they're right here. Uh, but let, let that grace lord like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. And then the verse three of that starts off, of that hymn starts off, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's that's our nature, isn't it? It's our mm -hmm. heart's nature. Our self nature mm -hmm. is that we would wander and we would leave God. And Judah certainly exemplified that. God, God didn't respond the way that they anticipated though. Lord, send rain. Um, because look, we're doing these acts of repentance. And God said, no, I'm, I am bringing judgment look at verse 11 the lord said to me do not pray for the welfare of this people though they fast i will not hear their cry though they offer burnt offering i know we just read this they offer burnt and grain offering i will not accept them but i will consume them by the sword by famine and by pestilence this is actually the third time that's recorded 
that God told Jeremiah, don't pray for these people. Their outward actions did not reflect their hearts. How, how is outward action connected with repentance? Well, it is connected with repentance if there's repentance. <laughs> outward action is connected with repentance that begins with a change of mind and a change of heart. Repentance literally means change of mind. And that's why in Romans 12, it says uh, to be renewed by the transformation, uh, transforming of your mind. It's a change of mind, but that's a change of mind that leads to outward actions that reflect that repentance. But we can, we can have a, a false appearance of repentance by just doing the actions, but there's no Jeremiah knew um, he wanted, he longed for God to, to bless, but he, he wanted God to bless in a way that he would even draw Judah to him and knew that hearts were far from God. Next section, um, there's a specific message here to the false prophets. Because there were false priests and false prophets that are proclaiming a message very different than Jeremiah's message. And so in verse 13, let's read this. Um, then I said, this is Jeremiah. He said, then I said, ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, you shall not see the sword. You shall not have famine. But I will give you assured peace in this place. Were, they, were the prophets and the priests, were they telling the truth? They were not. The message that these, these folks were presenting was actually different than Jeremiah's message. And it was, it was different from the message that God was proclaiming. And um, they would, Jeremiah saying, Lord, they're the ones that are misleading your people. It's those, because of them. And God is going to hold them accountable. But the people are not unaccountable. Listen to what he says here, continuing in verse 14. And the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them to or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, a worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, and who say, sword and famine shall not come in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. They will be accountable they will be consumed but then notice the verse 16 and the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of jerusalem victims of famine and sword with none to bury them them their wives their sons and their daughters for i will pour out their evil upon them god is god is telling very clearly these prophets will be held accountable but the people will also be held accountable. Why do you think the people are being held accountable too? Why, why are they to lies. I'm sorry? They're listening to lies and not listening to the truth, which is coming from God's prophet. They're listening to false prophets, which are telling them um, untruth, you know? <laughs> should, should they have been able to know the difference? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. These are God's people and have been God's people for generations and say they knew the, the history of God's faithfulness in the past and they knew about Moses and the Ten Commandments. Well, what are what are the Ten Commandments? What's the first two? No other gods before me. No God. other gods before me. <laughs> And don't make any don't make any craven images. Don't you shall not make for yourself an idol. And so they this is this is not something that's brand new. This is something that they've known. And yet the prophets are saying, okay, this is okay. I'm allowing you to come and worship God Yahweh in the temple, and we're also allowing you to come and worship the false gods outside the temple. And just because the priests and the prophets are saying, hey, this is okay, um, does not absolve God's people of the responsibility of being obedient to God. Mm -hmm. That's not just something that happened in, you know, 600 BC, 500 BC. That's something that happens in 20 and 20, 2021. There are people that proclaim a gospel that is far different than the, the true gospel of God's word. We, they're all over the airwaves and the internet and they write books and y'all um, they're, they're out there. <laughs> and I hope they're not in there in your home 
because there's an influence of many who, who preach a false gospel. And just because someone says, well, that sounds good to my ears, the philosophy feels good to my life, then I'm going to ascribe to this. Does not mean that, well, God's going to hold the teacher accountable, but he's not going to hold me accountable. He is. We all are being held accountable for our own faith and for our own obedience to God. Now, teachers, there is a great responsibility on teachers. He says that. They're held to a higher standard. Those that teach God's word, they're held to a higher standard. That's why we have to be anybody um, that really is a follower of Christ and you're speaking God's word. You may not have a role of a teacher, but when you're speaking truth um, in a situation, even in casual conversation with someone that's a friend that's going through a hard time or a family member, and you're telling them, well, God's word says this, you're teaching God's word. So please make sure that you know God's word, you're in God's word, that you're teaching with integrity that's in line with the truth of God's word. Um, I, I don't ever want to make light of, of God's word. And, you know, I'm, I know that a lot of people say things because of a verse, a portion of a verse that's out of context. And it says something different than what the whole council of scripture says. And um, so we have to be really careful that we know God's word and that we're speaking God's word with integrity. These false prophets, um, you know, there were tests in Deuteronomy 18. There's a test to determine if a prophet's true or not. And, and the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the um, test is that if that prophet's ever said anything that's going to happen and it didn't happen, well, that means that's a false prophet. And so um, that's, that's true then. It's true for us today. I've got, a, um, I don't know if you've ever had any encounters with Jehovah's Witnesses or, or Mormons. Um, there's a very zealous people and they have, they're very sincere people but they believe in a false gospel. And I know there's um, the, the, in the history of, well, for example, um, Jehovah's Witnesses in their history, there's false prophecies that have been made um, time and time again regarding the, 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 the return of Christ. It's going to happen in 1914. It's going to happen in 1925. And so even though today there are people that sincerely believe in the watchtower and believe in the material that's put out, there's, there, there's being fooled um, by false teaching and false prophecy. And so I've, I've got this letter at my house because sometimes, I don't know about you, but we, I have more Jehovah's Witnesses come to my house than I do Mormons. Actually, I've had nobody in the last year almost because of COVID, I guess. But uh, we used to have more Jehovah's Witnesses come to the house and um, pray for them as they come up. And But it was really interesting to have some conversation with them because they want to give you material. I mean, they're very nice, very generous, very open um, and, and forward and they're, and they're, you know, and, and expressive, um, but they want to give you some material to leave with you. And I, I say, well, I would love to, um, share something with you too. And so I have this letter I've made up and it's in an envelope and on the outside it says, thank you. And it's just, I just give it to them on the way out and I pray as they leave, Lord, please speak to hearts. And all that letter is inside, it says, thank you so much. I know you're very sincere in coming and sharing with me. Um, and I want to share with you why, um, I have this great concern for you and your, your soul and your salvation is because of the leader of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, leaders and watchtower have falsely uh, prophesied in the name of God. And these things did not come to pass. And what your Bible says in Deuteronomy 18 in your Bible, because they have their own version, the, the New World version, I think it is, in your Bible that says this, and it says what Deuteronomy says, if a pro, if a prophet prophesies in my name and does not come to pass he's a false prophet don't be afraid of him. so by their own bible the watchtower is a false prophet their leaders are false prophets and um and so here in judah god's people should have known because these false prophets and priests their messages did not line up with what they already knew about the word of god you shall have no other gods before me you shall not make any graven images and yet they did We've got a lot to finish up here in about three minutes. So um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to finish up right here and pick up the pace a little bit. Um, verses 17 and 18, we know Jeremiah is a weeping prophet. And we're going to see what breaks his heart in this next section. You shall say to them this word, let my eyes run down with tears night and day and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound and a very grievous blow. If you've, ever, if you've ever had a child that has been bullied or had something horrible perpetuated on them, you understand the burden that Jeremiah has for his people, but also that God has for his people. This 
it's Jeremiah and God, um, both of them are, are reflecting this grief and there's this weeping with the eyes. God's, God's not looking at this removed from it as if it's a hypothetical situation. This is impacting God um, tremendously. He weeps over the, the, the people that are rebelling against him. Um, and he says like a, like a parent would for a virgin daughter um, that is shattered with a great wound and grievous blow. Verse 18, he says, if I go out into the field, behold, those pierced by the sword. If I enter in the city, behold, the disease is a famine. There's brokenness everywhere. For both prophet and priest ply their trade through the land and they have no, law, no law, um, knowledge. They are ignorant, they are willfully ignorant. And they're, they're, the impact is impacting this, this whole land. And Jeremiah's heart is broken as God's heart is. In this final section, um, Jeremiah's, you can see in his words, as he struggles with this calamity that Judah has brought upon himself, he continues to seek to appeal to God. Now, God said, Jeremiah, don't pray for them. And so in this last passage, you'll see how Jeremiah, he's not saying, Lord, for them. He's saying, Lord, for us. So he's <laughs> actually praying for himself, but he's bringing Judah beside him. So he's praying for all of them, but he's in, changed the pronouns to, to us and, um, and we. Look what he says. Speaking to God, he says, have you utterly rejected Judah? Does your soul loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down? So that there's no healing for us. We looked for peace, but no good came. For a time of healing, but the whole terror. We acknowledge our wickedness, O oh Lord. Well, he does, but Judah's not. Um, he says, we acknowledge our wickedness, O oh Lord, and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the false gods of nations that can bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord our God? We set our hope on you, for you do all these things. I'm going to make an assumption here really quick that in this room, this Zoom room right now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, 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 thirteen. There's, there, I'm going to make an assumption. There are hundreds, maybe even thou, a thousand, um, certainly hundreds, close to a thousand, lived years represented right here in this room. And I know we live them concurrently, but I'm going to make an assumption. There's hundreds and hundreds, maybe even a thousand, especially with those that will be watching on video. That'll be watching on video. There's a thousand plus lived years right here. And I am almost certain that I can say this without any reservation at all, I guess. There's been a lot of personal calamity and disaster that's been experienced by this body, this group of people. There's been personal disappointments. There's been injury. There's been sickness. There's been brokenness. A lot that's been experienced by this group. There's also been national disasters that have been experienced by this group. There's been worldwide calamity that's been experienced by this group. One thing that we can see here is that God is the one that is bringing this calamity on Judah. It's bringing this drought to Judah as his judgment. And not that every calamity, every disaster that we, we experience personally doesn't mean it's because of my sin. My direct sin causes this direct calamity. Not, not necessarily true. We live in a world that's broken because of our sin. But sometimes God does bring calamity in order to bring judgment. But whether it's direct action of God to bring judgment or whether it's because we live in a broken world, every single disaster and personal difficulty and challenge that we experience is an opportunity for us to stop and say, Lord, search my heart. Help me to surrender everything to you. And if there is something in my life that is, that is keeping me from knowing the fullness of Christ in my life, I'm not asking you to change the circumstances because I'm, I'm going to live better, so change them because of my action. I'm saying, Lord, help me to surrender myself completely to you. Whether or not the drought ends, whether or not, as Habakkuk says, you know, there's olives in the olive press. 
Lord, help me to surrender myself to you. If there's sin, help me to repent. And sometimes these disasters and calamities and difficulties can point us to Christ. And, and they should um, in that. Unfortunately for Judah, the drought may uh, have caused some to have a temporary external change, but it was not internal and God knew their hearts. And so um, that's why he says in this final three questions here in verse 22, he says, are there any among the false nations that can bring rain? Well, the answer to that, of course not. There's no false gods that can bring rain. Are there, um, can the heavens give showers? He's saying, can nature itself give rain? Well, not apart from God, the one that created. The nature has no power to make a choice about that. Only God can, can ultimately the provider, can, can do that. But then he says, are you not he, O Lord, our God? And he's saying, okay, Lord, the answer is no to all these things. But yes, all these things. And so I love how 22 ends. He says, so we set our hope on you, for you can do all these things. Jeremiah knows that's true about himself. He longs for that to be true about the people of Judah. We set our hope on you. And, um, and that's true for, for you and, and for me. So I don't know what struggles you may have in your circumstances now or any time. But I do know that our one true source of hope is Jehovah God, God himself. And he's revealed himself in Christ. And it's in Christ we have hope. Jesus is our hope. So um, I hope this chapter encourages you to know where, just reminds you even, where, you, where your real source of hope is. Uh, and, and also that God knows and cares of the things that you are, are in your life. The, the people that you care about, the ones that you're burdened over, God knows and he cares. And, um, so I pray for you and you pray for me that as, as we grow in the Lord, that we would grieve over the things that, that grieves God. But then we also live in his power and proclaim the glory of, of his name and through his son, Jesus Christ, to a world that needs Jesus. And um, there's nobody on this planet right now that Jesus didn't die for. So we need to pray that the Lord would uh, use us to proclaim this glory. And the spirit would work in hearts to draw people to him. Well, that's all I've got. I want to ask you, is there anything you want to add? I know I'm a little longer today. I'm so sorry uh, for that. But I, I don't want to uh, close it off here. If you've got something to share, insight, or, or something you would like to add. Well, thank you all so much. Let me pray for us. And then um, we'll be done for the day. We'll be done pray. For the day. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, I ask... Just as we spoke and as we read your word, Lord, as we've talked together and read your word, I pray that you help our hearts to be surrendered to you, that we would have a heart that's quick to repent. And Lord, that when we repent, it would lead us to have outward actions that, that reflect the inward change of mind that your spirit has called us to. And Lord, would you transform us? I pray that for each one of us in this, in this Zoom room, each one that will be watching by video, but Lord, also for the whole body of Christ that we would, we would love each other in the power of Christ and we would be surrendered to you in such a way that the world looks on and, and our testimony would be like a city on a hill that we'd point to Christ, the one true source of hope and peace for all the world. I love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All Thank right. You, God bless y'all. Thank y'all for being here today. I love you, in the Lord. Thank you. And I hope you have a great week. You too. Thank you, Ron. Yep. All right. Y'all we'll on, so we got most of it. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Start calling y'all the geek squad. You help you That's help right. fix everything. <laughs> we just kept mashing buttons. There you go. <laughs> well, me too. I never did get my sound, but I am on the phone. <laughs> However you got here, glad you're here. <laughs> y'all have a great week. Thank you. Guys. All right. Thank you.